for the PowerPoint show for Unit 29. In Unit 29, we'll look at some applications of oxidation reduction, which is some, are some concepts you saw in the last unit. You should, before looking at this section, review sections 8.3 and 8.4 in the textbook to get a better understanding of what you're going to be up to. We're going to look at a couple different things, a couple different topics in here. One is uh, we're going to look at a description of electrochemical cells, probably better known to you as batteries. We're going to look at some electrochemical terminology, anodes, cathodes, thing of that, things of that nature. Look at, uh, I guess here, electrochemistry is applied to batteries, and also look at corrosion, because corrosion really is an application of oxidation reduction reactions. Look at electrochemistry overall and think about these reactions I'm showing you in this beaker here. Uh, we do this, we actually carry out this experiment in our Chem 1 labs. Uh, what you have on the left hand side is a copper wire and it's in a solution of silver nitrate. Remember, silver nitrate would be AG and then NO3 is the nitrate group. So fundamentally, it's really silver ions and copper metal is inside that flask. If you let it sit for a little while, You'll come back and you'll find out you have a beaker that looks like the one on the right, which has copper nitrate in it now, actually copper two ions, and has silver metal. So if you look at the two elements involved, the primary elements involved are copper and silver, the copper starts out as the element on the left-hand side and ends up in solution over on the right-hand side as copper two ions. So the copper has gone from copper metal to copper two plus, He's lost two electrons. That means he's been oxidized in this process. The silver, on the other hand, started out as silver plus one ions in that solution on the left, ends up as silver metal. That's what the kind of uh, the stuff hanging on the copper wire on the right-hand side is. That's silver metal that you formed. Pay attention to the blue color in that solution on the right. We'll mention that in just a second. So. If you look at what we have going on here, what I've just described is, is written out in color here. The copper two ions that are formed on the right-hand side are the ions that form that color in that solution. It's a blue-colored solution because it has copper two ions, and the copper metal, copper atoms, which had their full complement of electrons, have given up two electrons and gone into solution, and that solution turns blue. If you had copper one ions in solution, that solution would actually be green. They have different colors in solution. The silver ions, previously just floating around the solution, <coughs> now are actually elemental silver hanging off of the copper in that right-hand beaker. If you put, it, put an equation form, the copper is a solid. It starts out as a solid on the left, ends up producing copper two ions, which means it's giving up electrons. So the product of that is you get copper two ions, and you also give up two electrons in that process. The silver, on the other hand, starts out as silver plus one ions, picks up an electron and forms silver metal on the other side. And so in electrochemistry, chemistry, it's fairly important to understand how these two reactions work together. So what we can do, each of the reactions we've written is called a half reaction. One of them tells us about an oxidation, the other tells us about a reduction. Which one's the oxidation? Which one do you think is the oxidation? You said the top one, you're right. Because in the top one, a couple of ways of thinking about it, the copper went from a zero to a plus two, so it went up in oxidation number, so that would make it an oxidation. The other thing is, you can tell by looking at the equation, it's giving up electrons, isn't it? It's giving up two electrons. That's one of the products in it. Now, in order to take these two reactions and put them together to tell us what's going on in the cell, we have to recognize that our electrons have to be balanced out. So if the copper is going to give up two electrons, there has to be some place those two electrons can go. And those two electrons can't go to one silver, because each silver can only take on one electron. So what you see in this process is we have to do some balancing. Back to like balancing equations, we have to balance these things so that our electrons match coming in and going out. And so the next slide we'll take a look at that and see what we can do is think about just multiplying the whole equation by some number to get the electrons to match up. So keep these, these equations in mind. Copper goes to copper ion and two electrons. Silver ion and an electron goes to silver metal. And take a look at this next slide. Okay, so in the top reaction here, I've got the copper metal going to copper ions and two electrons. And then the second one down there, I've got silver ions going to, picking up an electron and going to silver metal. You notice that what I've done is I've multiplied by two in front of that bottom reaction. 
That's because I have to have as many electrons going into this process as I have coming out. They have to balance out. And the way it's written, if it's written without the two, I have two electrons being given up by copper and only one being taken on by silver. So the way I accommodate for, account for that is to multiply that second equation by two. Okay, and then when I do that, here's what it looks like. I multiply through the copper one, doesn't really change at all. But now the silver one, everything in the silver gets multiplied by two. Everything. When you're multiplying, it's just like in math. You multiply an equation by two, everybody has to be multiplied by two. There are no favorites, okay? And so then you get to these two equations. You're going to take and add these two equations together. When you do that, what you find in the bottom, just look at where the arrows are. You can put everybody that's on the left, on the left-hand side of the arrow, everybody that's on the right-hand side of the arrow, on the right-hand side of the arrow. You notice that you have two electrons <coughs> on the left and two electrons on the right, which means you could just skip writing them in there. You can basically cancel them out. Kind of like a math-looking thing, isn't it? You can take and cancel those guys out, and you'll be fine. So my balanced equation is the one at the bottom. Now, if you left the twos out, you'd say, wait a minute, it's still balanced. I still have one copper on each side and one silver on each side. But if you were to do that, you haven't paid attention to the electrons. And so the properly balanced equation is that one at the bottom of the page. Now let's look at electrochemical cells. So the reaction we just saw all went on in one flask. If we could figure out a way of separating those two components from each other, we could actually get those electrons to maybe go through a wire and do something useful for us. And so we can do that by setting up a beaker that looks like this. That yellow thing in the middle is what we call semi-permeable membrane. It only lets some things go through. And what this one lets go through is it lets the solvent go through. It also lets the nitrate ions pass through, those negatively charged nitrate ions. Notice they didn't take place anywhere in the reaction, did they? But what we do in this, in this cell is we allow the nitrate ions to go through that membrane. And what happens in this process, remember that, that the silver is picking up electrons, isn't it? Okay, so the electrons are going from the copper to the silver. That's the blue arrows at the top. That's a light bulb there that I've drawn without a filament or anything. That's a light bulb. The electrons are going through there. They're lighting my light bulb out. They're going over to the silver. And what happens then is those electrons come into there. Silver ions go over and pick up electrons and form silver metal. And the nitrate ion passes through to the left-hand side because if it didn't, the whole thing would go dead. It has to have electrical flow. It has to have like a current flowing through it in the whole time. And so as you look at that diagram, this really is a way of getting that light bulb to light up. The copper is an electrode. It's a piece of wire stuck in there. It's called the anode because that's where the oxidation is occurring. The silver on the right-hand side is called the cathode because that's where the reduction is occurring. If you look at a different type of electrochemical cell, here's a, here's a battery regular um, dry cell battery that you're looking at, and she gives you a little bit of the, the construction inside as a paste of manganese dioxide, and ammonium chloride, and carbon, all these interesting things in batteries. Uh, I have a simplified version of the reaction written there that you can look at. You don't have to memorize any of those, by the way. Um, alkaline cells are kind of like this, too. They replace the KOH, uh, replace... Uh, use KOH in the paste, and they're a little bit expensive, but they last somewhat longer. And the question here is, when you look at that equation above, can you tell me which substance is oxidized? Is it the zinc or is it the manganese dioxide? Which one do you think is oxidized in that reaction? If you guessed the zinc, you didn't guess. I mean, if you picked zinc, you'd be correct, because the zinc actually lost two electrons in, in that process. And here's a famous one, the lead storage battery. One typically in a car, although I'm not sure how they make the batteries for hybrids and all that these days. I'll have to look at what kind of batteries those are. This is the old one found in cars. Um, pretty nasty, old, big, heavy battery. Has sulfuric acid in it. Uh, has lead in it. Has all sorts of interesting environmental things in it. A typical 12-volt lead storage battery, if you look at the top where the cells are, you'll see that there are six of them across there. Each one of those cells develops two volts. And so if you put six of them in series like that, you have a 12-volt drop, and that's where you get the <coughs> 12 volts in your battery. That equation there in the middle is kind of interesting just from this standpoint. When that equation is going to the left, that means you're discharging in the battery. You're starting your car. So when you go into your car, you turn the key, and you get ready to start it. 
going to the right hand side you're taking your lead and your lead four oxide and your sulfuric acid you're converting them into the products over on the right hand side once you've got started up then your alternator comes and runs through it the other way and you actually take and bring lead to sulfate and water back to the other side you run it in the reverse direction that's why you can get so many starts out of your car you're always recharging it in that process And then a little bit about corrosion. Corrosion is a pretty big economical uh, factor in the United States. I have some data up there in the top to show you about 20% of the iron and steel production is used to replace corroded items. So you kind of like to prevent corrosion. I guess unless you're in the steel, iron and steel production business, you'd like it to keep going because that's 20% of your business. But you'd like to put something together and have it stay for a while. In the, in the corrosion process, what happens is the iron metal actually is the element. Iron has no charge on it to start with, but it'll be oxidized Fe2 while the oxygen in the air gets reduced to the hydroxide ion. So it's kind of a, it's a complicated looking reaction to start with, but ultimately what we form is you will form iron 3 oxide, which is what we know as rust. Uh, the electrons in the process transfer through the metal itself. Met iron conducts electricity, so it's kind of its own <coughs> worst enemy in that sense, but it needs an electrolyte to complete the whole circuit, something will conduct electricity as well. And so you'll find like in northern climates or in, in Gulf areas, Gulf Coast areas, you know, saltwater areas, you'll find that corrosion is more uh, invasive because you have salt in your water and that forms electrolyte basis to help complete the circuit for this. Um, sometimes in a case like this, what we'll do is if we have an object we really want to save, if you have a gas pipeline, if you have a ship hull, something like that, you really don't want to lose it to corrosion because of the expense of replacing it. One of the things you can do is put something in contact with it that's more easily oxidized and more easily replaced, and then you can just take and replace it as you need to. It's called a sacrificial anode. You'll see one in just a minute. Here's examples of corrosion. Um, as you can tell, just kind of rusted through on this fence post, a fence in this gate. Uh, here's uh, here's somebody obviously neglected this ship, uh, but you can see the corrosion just taking over the whole thing. It's just the reaction between the iron and the oxygen. It's an oxidation reduction process going on. This is, this is sitting in some who knows what whether it's salt water or not, but you can tell this hole eventually won't be there anymore. Okay? It, of course, the iron atoms will be there somewhere else, but but it won't be there anymore at all. So how do you prevent that from happening? Suppose you have a ship you don't want to have that happen to. You can't really replace the hull all the time. That's kind of expensive to do that. Here's one of the approaches you can use. Called sacrificial anodes. And if you look at the yellow arrows I have at the bottom where it's pointing at it says sacrificial anodes, those little ingots that are stuck in the hull of this ship are called anodes. They're probably made out of magnesium or something like that that's easily oxidized. And what will happen is with the iron hull and something more easily oxidized, the oxidation will take place with the more easily oxidized material. In this case, the ingot that you have along the side. So what that does is that means that those ingots will be the things that are oxidized. Those ingots are the things that will go bad. But that's pretty easy to fix. If you have one of those ingots going bad, you just take it off, put another one on, and you're good to go. If you didn't have them on there, and you have your hull starting to corrode because of that repairing a hull is much more complicated and expensive than having to go in and swap out some ingots once in a while. You'll find this in railroad tracks, gas pipelines, they'll just have a, a wire running down with something pounded into the ground, okay, and that's your sacrificial anode. <laughs> it's very easy to replace those. Much less expensive and much less disruptive to replace than it is to actually replace the pipeline or the railroad track or whatever it's going to be. This is the end of the Unit 29 slideshow. Uh, you should look at the self-assessments associated with these sections, look at the Blackboard self-assessment, and be prepared for this on the quiz and the final exam coming up.